Oh there she goes. <laughs> this was earlier this summer on a property in West Michigan where a landowner and his family contacted me to see what they could do to improve their quality of hunting. They have two parcels, a 60 acre piece with a river running through the north half and an 80 acre piece about a mile away with a river winding through it splitting it into northern and southern halves. Both parcels are very different from each other. The 60 acres is 90% open timber with sight lines of 100 to 200 yards when the leaves are down. According to the landowner, it was strictly a pass-through property. The 80 acres was totally different. The north side of the river was open ground with very little timber. Mostly scrub oaks and pines growing in a field of very sandy soil with a blanket of bracken fern. The south side of the river is low ground that gets very wet every time the river rises. There's lots of swamp grass with thick nasty brush that was almost impenetrable. But when the hunting pressure builds during the fall, there's still plenty of dry spots in the heavy cover for mature bucks to hide from the extreme pressure this area gets. With the very little amount of woody browse available, the only food source available other than acorns dropping in the fall was a small tenth of an acre food plot on the 60 acres. In a nutshell, their property had very little predictability, no holding power, and a game plan that was based on mostly hope and luck. By the second day of firearm season, all the fun in hunting is out the window. Unfortunately, this is a common scenario on most deer hunting properties. This causes landowners to ask two of the most common questions when wanting to make changes for the better. What should I do and where do I start? Most are afraid of doing the wrong thing and setting themselves back several years. And that's a valid concern. But just sitting back and hoping for the best every year is only going to guarantee that your property will never reach its full potential of attracting and holding mature bucks. So kudos to this landowner for reaching out to get a game plan so they can move forward without having to second guess every move they make. When I showed up to check out their properties, we rode around the 60 acre parcel first to get an overview before scouting on foot. Lots of mature timber with oaks and maples and poplars. The best two features on this property was the river and some good topography that will help them access and funneling deer in the future. The landowner was totally on board when I suggested he get a forester to come out and look at the property and get the ball rolling to remove the mature timber and then some. This place needed sunlight to get the early successional growth started with new brows and forbs that deer really need. That will turn into cover and bedding as well so they can start holding deer instead of just being a pass through property. In future videos I'm going to feature other client properties that had the same issue but are now already on the road to generating food and cover resulting in more deer on the property. When we checked out the 80 acre parcel we headed right down to the river bottom. We found lots of beds in the tall swamp grass and inside the thick brush. This was definitely the only bedding cover they had and it could only be hunted at the right time of year with the right wind and weather conditions and then probably only one or two hunts per stand site. By now the skeeters were getting thick and the temp was getting hot so we checked out the open high ground on the other side of the river. Here they had a big 20 acre triangle piece of open ground which was the only option they had to be their main food source in the future. The only problem was that it was some of the most poor soil I had ever run into. Very sandy with crunchy moss and knee high bracken fern. I joked that the pH was probably below zero. But with the right amendments, he'd be able to grow grains like winter rye grain, oats, buckwheat, and annual clover. Rotating these a couple times a year without tilling or disking will build up the soil and give them other options in a few years. After visiting the property, I took all the information I gathered that day like photos, videos, and waypoints for tree stand locations, access trails, the track we laid down, and paired that with the information he shared with me like their harvest goals, when they like to hunt, their favorite hunting method and how many people and how aggressive do they want to get with having trees removed by a logger to open up the canopy so they can start the regeneration process of growing more natural food and cover. All that info is taken into consideration when I create a habitat plan with a hunting strategy on the big screen. After a few days I invited the landowner and the other hunters to a zoom call so I could explain the plan and give them a priority list and several how-to PDFs so they have a blueprint on how to move forward with confidence. This also gives them an opportunity to get all their questions answered. Even after all this there's bound to be more questions down the road so I make it clear to every landowner that I'm only a text, email, or phone call away. I consider this to be a very important part of the service to helping landowners always moving forward in the right direction. 
So if we look at the habitat plan here for the 60 acre property, you can see that down here on the south end is where their only access is. They've got private land on the west side, they've got private land on the east side. They really can't access via the river on a boat or a canoe because there's just way too many deadfalls across the river, so that's not an option. And to the north of them is all public land and it's quite a ways to the next road. Not that they can't walk in, they definitely can, but that's not going to be uh, the most convenient. So the road right here on the south end is really their only access and that really limits them as far as you know wind directions and that type of thing. So you can see that it's pretty hilly on this property. We've got some uh, low ground here obviously by the river and then as you get away from the river it gets into high ground. This is a really, really high knob right here which really does limit their access coming down the west side and down here on the east side, you know, they run into a river bottom. It's nice and thick and nasty where there's a lot of bedding. So, you know, normally I like to put in a perimeter trail around the property. But on this one, it's just not in the cards to get that done. So they're going to just have to continue to use this two track that goes up the middle. And because it's up in the middle, uh, we had to put food plot here on the west side. We're going to put one here on the east side. And this is about some of the biggest areas that have level ground is in these two areas right here. So they can get about two acres on each side of the two track, but we're gonna have to leave about 50 to 60 yards from the two track all the way to the food plot just so that these guys can get through here if there's deer up in these food plots. And then as far as hunting the food plots, they're just gonna have to hunt that according to the wind. So now you can see we've got several orange stars that are right close to the food. These are hunting locations for like the early season or non-rut stands. And then we've got red stars or red hunting locations that are geared toward the rut. So say after October 26 or so, uh, these, are, these are stands that you kind of want to back off those food plots because you're going to have uh, bucks that are going to be cruising around the food, cruising around the bedding, and that way they're going to uh, pass right in front of you. You can see that we've got the, uh, the yellow areas with the black hash marks. Those are uh, hinge cut bedding areas. Obviously, we want to put some over here on high ground, um, some right next to the food on the opposite side from the trail. We're going to have bedding on that side and then also over here on the east side. The landowner said that he's got a lot of deer that cross the road right here. And there's several trails that come into the property, and he's already got a stand right here where this red one is. So what I suggest is that he lay down a bunch of trees in a row via hinge cut and just block off several of these trails and just leave the one coming around the near side on the east end. And that way this one will be within bow range, going to be an easy shot for him right here from this tree stand. The yellow dot's going to be a mock scrape. The white star right here is a suggested location for a trail camera. And so we have several of these uh, barricades or hinge cut barriers throughout the property based on topography and deer movement and all that. So now as far as removing the canopy and letting a bunch of sunlight in to start the process of regeneration for food and cover, you can see that the yellow shaded area here is the area that I suggest that he have a forester come in and look at and let's get this ball rolling and get these big trees out of here. This uh, takes up about 40 acres out of the 60. This is where all the mature timber is. And I suggested that he talk to the forester about these food plots where when the logger comes in, they can clear cut these green food plot areas here. So we got, you know, two acres on each side. And after the loggers are gone, he'll have a couple different options, whether or not he has a dozer come in here or an excavator to take out the stumps or maybe even a forestry mulcher to clean up things after that. But then also after they're gone, they'll be able to come in here and do a bunch of this uh, hinge cut bedding and that is always something that you want to do after the loggers are gone. Now one interesting location on this parcel was this northern section up here across the river. This really got me excited because this is a big high plateau that is pretty isolated and they don't hunt it very much because, well, it's hard to hunt. It's hard to get to. you got to walk across the river. And up here we got a lot of big white oaks, big red oaks, and some big maples. And I suggested to the landowner that we come in here and Let's just hinge cut most of these big trees in here. You know, they're never going to get this thing logged off because the equipment can't cross the river. They're not going to come in from the north across public land. So let's just turn this into a big old bedding area here on this high plateau. And we'll get multiple doe family groups living up here. Who knows, might even get, you know, some bucks living in up here. But the reason why this is going to be such a great bedding area is because we got the river on three sides 
you know, all the way around the low part down here at the river bottom is really nasty thick. So these deer are, are nice and high and dry. They got good air movement going through here. And if we can take a bunch of this timber down to their level, it's going to create cover. It's going to create food. It's going to, you know, start that regeneration process. So the landowner had me come back in August to uh, get this done. And in about three hours, we had a lot of the big trees laying on the ground. So, you know, we went from a wide open plateau to an area where it was nice and thick and the deer are going to want to bed in here. So, you know, we cleaned up some aisleways for the deer to get through. And after the fact, the landowners are going to come in here and do some of the detail work, you know, clean up some of the bedding areas, cut out some of the small branches that might poke the deer in the eye and just make this a nice five star hotel up here. And then what's going to happen is during that rut period when these bucks are seeking and chasing, you know, these does are going to be bedded up in here. And so I suggested the landowner prep this big cedar tree that's right here at this red star. And with an east or west wind, he'll be able to hunt this tree at the end of October during the seeking phase or the rut phases. And it really pinches down to about a 40-yard neck right here. And this is going to be one heck of a pinch point where bucks are going to come in here and be checking for hot estrus does. You know, they're, they're going to come down the hill, cross the river. And, you know, once this area gets all nice and thick and we got other bedding areas, now we're going to have food on the property. Now we got reasons for these does and bucks to be hanging around. They're going to have uh, some of the thickest cover around because nobody else is uh, doing any hinge cutting. And very few people have, you know, four acres of of green food in the woods so you know there are some corn and soybean fields around but after those fields are picked you know there's not much food left so i always say the guy with the most green food in november is going to have a lot of deer on the property now just a funny side note when i got there in august to do the hinge cutting the landowner had never seen any hinge cutting done before in person so he fired up his phone to film me take down the first batch of trees and the question he asked me after the first bunch of trees came down was pretty funny So was that good or bad? Now this 80 acre piece holds a lot more promise, especially in the near term while the other parcel is getting logged and it starts its regeneration process. Because on this parcel here, we've got a lot of uh, bottom land in here where it's nice and thick. So there's already a lot of bedding going on. We can make it better though and enhance it. And then over here to the north side, obviously is gonna be their big food plot. And now if we concentrate first though here on the south side, you can see that right down here by the road is their only access to get in here to the south side of the river. You can also see that right here is the line of high ground and this is where they're gonna be accessing from. So we're not gonna do any logging over here. We don't wanna make this thick because this is the areas that the hunters are gonna to have to access through. And if we make this nice and thick, well then the deer are gonna bed here and then they're gonna be bumping deer now, one of the things I wanted to point out, and this is something that I see quite often when I visit properties, and that is landowners will put a tree stand right in an area where they see a lot of deer sign. They see a lot of beds, they see a lot of rubs, a lot of scrapes, and they'll move right in there and they'll put in a tree stand so that they can capitalize on all that activity. And that was the case right here. Uh, the landowner, when we went and looked at this originally just to scout the property, we saw that he had a tree stand right here on the river's edge. And that was because he had a lot of movement going in through here. There was a nice big tree here along the river. And so, you know, he figured that, hey, with the river right there, it would kind of protect him scent wise and he could get into this tree, turn around and then face kind of southeast and capitalize on some of this deer movement that went through here. Now, that might be a good idea if you're coming in on a boat, you know, and you could just come right in off the boat, climb in the tree, and you're good to go. But in his situation, they weren't doing that because, you know, there's just, like I said, too many windfalls across the river. So he had to come in through the woods and then go down in through this thick area that was nastier than all get out and then bust through this stuff just to get to the tree and then turn around and hunt the area that he just walked through, right? So... 
I, I suggested instead of doing all that, then he could hunt right here on the end of this point. Now, this was kind of high ground up here, as you can see by this topo line right there. So there was a really big beech tree sitting right here where the red star is. I suggested, you know what, let's put a stand into this beech tree. That way you don't have to intrude down into this area. And we'll drop some trees in a line from the river pointing toward the stand as a barricade so that these deer can't hug the river as they come around, right? So this barricade is going to make them come out and around a little bit closer to that big beech tree. And we'll put in a mock scrape right here. And that way, you know, any deer that comes around here is going to be within bow range. And he's not going to alert these deer with the scent on the ground because he only has to come in right to the end of this point. The other reason I like this point here is it's kind of a ridge. And, you know, deer coming from across the road or from the neighbors, if they want to get down into this thick bedding area and hide while the pressure is on, you know, a lot of times these deer will run right down the ridge and come right down the point into the thick stuff. Well, he'll have a tree right here and he'll be able to capitalize on that. So not only is he has the possibility of movement to the river, but he's got the movement going along the river right through all this thick stuff. And I would predict that there's probably a lot of bucks chasing does and a lot of rutting going on in this in this thick stuff down here during the uh, the pre-rut and the rut. So, you know, a situation like this, you can capitalize on it without actually getting down into the thick stuff. He had the same thing going on over here. He had another stand right here along the river. And, it, man, it was really intrusive to get there. So I suggested, man, let's put a tree back in over here. We'll create a couple of uh, barriers right there. And we'll capitalize on these deer crossing the river or going along the river without him having to bust all the way through there. You can see that we got a lot of uh, hinge cut barricades uh, in this area just because it is so thick. You can't see very far. And so, you know, there's just way too much random movement through here. And this way, you know, you can pinch these deer down right to where you want these deer to go. You can see that this barricade right here from the river is pretty much going to block off the cross traffic across this peninsula. This thing's about 120 yards long, and it's going to prevent these deer from getting through east to west. It's going to make them come out and around this barricade and then right within bow range of the stand right here. So this is a very effective thing that you can do. I mean, when we created this barricade right here, I bet you it only took us 10 minutes to get that done. So, you know, very effective way to do it. I don't like putting fences out in the woods. I just don't like the looks of it, and they don't last very long. And it's just, I just feel, you know, I like to keep things natural. So, and like I said earlier, these red stands during the rut and pre-rut are going to be stands where you're only going to want to sit there maybe once or twice because it is pretty intrusive to get down into some of these thick areas. And, you know, you get in here once or twice and, you know, you stink the place up and, and it's just not going to be as effective the second or third sit. So that's why you want multiple uh, stands down in this thick area. And, you know, he's going to have different wind directions that he can choose from. And even over here on the north side of the river, uh, we created a couple of uh, really long barricades over here so he can capitalize on, you know, just moving deer closer to his stands. And that's going to work out very, very well. The day that I was there hinge cutting in August, uh, we also came down into this big peninsula down in here. And there was some massive big trees, some really big uh, maples that were absolutely not doing any good to the deer. So they were just creating a lot of shade. And when the swamp grass all falls down, you know, after some hard freezes and the snow, I mean, there is absolutely no cover. You could see all the way across these uh, peninsulas here. So the day that I was there with the chainsaw, we came in and we took down some massive trees. And uh, there was one tree that was 40 inches in diameter. And, you know, my, the bar on my chainsaw was only 18 inches long. And because it's not going to hinge, obviously, I put a face cut on it and then came around on the back side. And it came down right where we wanted it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. 
Now, to get across the river here, what we had to do is we had to get back in our vehicles, take this road, and then we can access the north side from uh, this road here on the west. So he's got an access trail that comes in off over here on the north side. He's got an access trail that comes just north of the river. So this is the area here that was all bracken fern and very sandy soil. As you can see, the ground is pretty tan. But right down here, you, you can see where the ground really drops off pretty sharply right down to the river. So if you think about it, you got high ground here, you got the river down here. So this is a pretty steep drop right there. And, you know, when these when these bucks are chasing and seeking, you know, they want to get from point A to point B. They're going to be hugging this river and they're going to be going just on the north side of every single one of these little oxbows here. And they're going to be cruising down here toward the southwest. So I suggested to the landowner that, you know what, let's put in some uh, rut stands right up in here on this hillside. Not that he has to climb a tree, but just get up there on the side of the hill and, you know, dig a hole on the front side of a tree or on the back side of the tree and make a natural ground blind with some of the surrounding logs and debris that is available. And that way he can brush himself in really well and the fact that a lot of these are cedars and big conifers is going to limit him from getting up in a tree anyway so during that late october time frame this would be a great spot to come in here and just wait for some of these bucks to come cruising by and if you think about it it's going to work out really well because you're going to want to hunt this with some sort of a south wind like a southeast wind or a southwest wind or a straight south wind because what's going to happen the reason why these bucks are going to cruise down the edge of all these oxbows here is with that southerly wind, they're going to be able to scent check all these bedding areas here that are in this river bottom, right? So being on the north side here, they're going to be able to take advantage of that wind, and you're going to be north of that deer trail. So your scent's going to be going away from that buck trail, and that's going to be a real scent safe way to hunt. And you'll probably be able to hunt this more than once or twice because, you know, the access is really easy. You're not intruding very far into the property. And that's another reason why this barricade is right here so that these bucks can't cheat and jump across the river and go through the middle of the bottomland, right? So it's going to keep them on the outside of this oxbow right within bow range of this ground blind right here. So the day that I was there, you know, we created some beds in here. We took down some big timber. Uh, you know, we, we made these barricades over here and then, you know, some of these over here, but we, you know, didn't get near all of it done. So he's going to have me come back next April and we're going to finish up some more of these bedding areas. We're going to create some more of these barricades. And I told the landowner, you know, as you're hunting it this fall, just be aware and be observant as to where these deer are going and make notes to yourself, even if you have to write them in your phone, as to where you want to block off some some of these deer trails where you can't access to and block these deer to move them a little bit closer to you. And then we'll take care of that the next spring when I come back with a chainsaw. So now the last thing I want to talk about was this uh, big open field here. And I say open, but there was a lot of uh, conifers, as you can see. And there was a lot of scrub oaks and just, uh, you know, some trees that just weren't of any timber value at all. So because the property here to the north is all public land, you know, we don't want to put this food plot near that public land at all. We want to keep a good distance from there. Uh, this is a road right here where, you know, he's telling me about the locals driving around at night, shining and all that. And he's telling me about how some of these state landers are walking right through his swamp here and going through the property and you know camping right out on the property line so no way do we want to have this food plot close to the north side or close to the west side so i would say that this is probably a good um, maybe 120 yards all the way from the food plot to the road and to the public land up here and it is a little bit lower as far as topography goes so it's almost kind of like in a little bit of a bowl so that works out very well but then I also suggested that just as an added layer of security and even for the deer benefit is to put a, a row of switchgrass all the way around the outside. That's going to also help the hunters come in from the perimeter and stage up on the side of the food plot and be able to hunt this food plot and be able to get into a blind and get out of the blind without being seen by the deer. 
so the type of blinds that I suggested were going to be ground blinds that are hidden in some of these big conifer trees. There's some big old scrub oaks as well that uh, they can do a little bit hinge cutting because there's some smaller trees, you know, around some of these big ones. And that's exactly what he did. So he told me later that he went in and hinge cut a bunch of these uh, stands right here. And he's going to dig a hole and then brush himself in there really, really well. So the other thing I mentioned to him is just don't cut all the big trees that are inside the green area. Leave them for structure. It's going to break up the sight lines in this food plot. You know, deer over here can't see deer over here who can't see deer over here. So you're going to get a lot more deer activity in this food plot with multiple family groups without all the social stress. And they did a great job at that. They cut out just a few of the little annoying ones, but all the bigger trees in here, they just left them. So they came in with a sprayer and sprayed all the bracken fern. Then they mowed them all down. And then they came in and lightly dissed this uh, big old food plot because it was pretty rough. Um, there was some moss growing on top. So it just initially had to be cleaned. But I told him, you know, man, just don't go very deep with that disc or tiller because you just don't want to bring up a lot of new sand. So they got it cleaned up very, very nicely. And they came in with a bunch of lime and fertilizer and some calcium. And they went and planted some oats, some winter rye, some radishes, and some crimson clover. There was rain in the forecast for three different opportunities right after they planted, and none of those rain opportunities materialized. They all fizzled out, and it was right in the middle of August, and right after that was that hot dry spell that we had. So the landowner went in about three weeks later, and he broadcast about 100 pounds per acre of uh, winter rye grain. But uh, next year will be different. His pH is going to be much better. He's going to have more nutrients in the soil. And then I'll recommend that he has a uh, local farmer come in and drill in John Comp's soil builder from Northwoods Whitetails. So there's a lot of other things going on with this habitat plan, a lot of other little strategies involved, but uh, this video is getting long enough. So anyway, I think you get the idea of how not to hunt some of your better stands early in the season. You know, you've got to have your early season stands and you've got to have your later rut season stands where... You just stay out of those until the time is right. So hopefully you got some good takeaways out of this video. If so, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe for more upcoming content like this. And I'll see you on the next video. There she goes. That wasn't loud. <laughs>